people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. with this, a bit of news that may be flying low on the radar. Former IBF welterweight champion Ivana Habazin of Croatia stated, So sad to see the lack of support from Matchroom for Jessica, the unified ex-undisputed champion. Anyway, I am happy that my team won the purse bid. It's not all about money, it's about legacy. Hashtag all the belts. The bid amount that Matchroom is thinking to pay me, I got that amount 10 years ago. All this talk from Eddie Hearn about women's boxing and better pay is fake. A few weeks ago, Ivana Habazin claimed to be the mandatory challenger for several of Jessica McCaskill's remaining titles. The IBF, I believe, the WBC, and the WBA. The IBF title has since gone vacant, though I can only deduce that that same IBF title will be on the line when Jessica and Ivana meet. Pertaining to the purse bid and what the winning bid was, Matchroom only bid $91,000 for the rights to the fight, whereas Ivana Habazin's team bid over two times as much. $201,000 was the winning bid for the rights to this fight. My thoughts. Matchroom couldn't have been invested in this fight, not based on a $91,000 bid. For that, they might as well have bid nothing at all. And that's saying that based on a $91,000 bid they couldn't have been invested in this fight it couldn't have been their intention to procure the rights to it because surely they could have come up with something more substantial if it were in fact their intention to win the rights to this fight Ivana's people bid twice as much so even though Jessica McCaskill is the reigning defending champion Ivana Habazin will be the one that has home field advantage and Jessica will be the away fighter so it breaks down Ivana claims that all this talk from Eddie Hearn about bettering women pay in the sport is fake. She's not a matchroom fighter. And it's unclear to me at this time whether or not Jessica McCaskill is even under contract with matchroom. Based on that bid, I suspect that she isn't. Yeah, I don't get the sense that she's under contract with them. Because if she were, perhaps they would have put up a more substantial bid in order to ensure they get the rights to this fight, like what we saw with the purse bid for Ebony Bridges versus Shotgun Shannon O'Connell. They won the rights to that fight. They won that purse bid, but not this one. Though it still seems a bit unfair to me for Ibana Habazin to accuse Eddie Hearn and Matchroom's commitment to the sport of women's boxing, to accuse their commitment of being fake on the premise that they didn't get her a bunch of money didn't get her a bunch of cash. Or because they didn't throw a bunch of cash at this fight because, put simply, this is not a cash fight. This is not a cash fight. This is not a high-profile fight. It's not. The bid that Matchroom put up for this fight reflects what they think this fight is worth commercially. They don't think it's worth a lot of money. It's not a sweepstakes, you know. It's not a giveaway. You don't get what Katie Taylor gets. You don't get what Amanda Serrano, Clarissa Shields, or somebody else gets. You don't. It's not a giveaway. I will admit I'm surprised that Matchroom got beat out by Ivana Habazin's team, though all the same. Maybe they value the fight a bit more than Matchroom does because they want home field advantage, because they want to be in control. Maybe. Matchroom's commitment to their Valkyries, to their female fighters, is far from fake, and your issue is that you're not one of them. So it breaks down. Matchroom, at the very least, would use a fight like this, a fight that doesn't really have a profile, it's not a cash fight of any kind, they'd likely use this as a decorative item somewhere on an undercard of a bigger fight, something more main event worthy, thus they weren't going to spend an arm and a leg to procure the rights to it. The rights to this, that's the look of it. But it's not because they're not committed to growing the sport of women's boxing and bettering fighter pay, put simply, you're or just not one of their fighters. I don't know, but I'm not sure if Jessica's still one of their fighters either. She might not be. Not right now anyway, so they're not that committed to her. Not at this moment, not for this fight. Jessica's got to get herself back in the winner's bracket. I think she can. Irrespective of this purse bid stuff, don't kid yourself. Ivana Habazin ain't no Chantel Cameron. Chantel 
may have dominated Jessica McCaskill. But Ivana Habazin won't, irrespective of this purse bid stuff. I'm quite confident that Jessica still has enough left in the tank to beat somebody like Ivana Habazin, get herself back in the winner's bracket, and move into a bigger fight with a bigger name. And that's what this is all about. Every fight's commercial value is not the same across the board. And someone should perhaps explain that to Ivana. That applies to men's boxing the same way it applies to women's boxing. Just because there's three or four or however many alphabet titles on the line, the fight's commercial value is the fight's commercial value. That varies depending on how much money the fight can generate. In this instance, McCaskill versus Habazin, mandated title fight that it might be, it's really not a big fight. She's expecting big money. Looks like this is going to be Jessica McCaskill's next outing and we'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches as soon as there is a fight date this is steven espinoza being interviewed about tank davis pay-per-views and debunking the sixty-one thousand. look how, how much he did look what she missed to you know I, I said what i said on social media the, the stupid number of 61 that was going around you know that, that's that's basically the cable number by itself so the total number is and if you know anything cable is is a a fraction not even close to 50 percent we can do the math and you know we're not we're not at, at 200 but this would be his second biggest behind behind Rolly, which was his biggest oh, okay we're not at, at 200 but we're not at, at 200 but we're not at, at 200 but this would be his second biggest behind behind Rolly, which was his biggest oh, okay this audio from Showtime Sports executive Stefan Espinoza has been making the rounds right here on the YTBC. It's gone through Blue Blood Sports' channel and Barbershop Conversations' channel, and now it's here. It's confirmation of what I've been telling you. That while the journos and the pundits may report an estimated 225,000 pay-per-view buys, according to Stefan Espinoza himself, it didn't do 200,000. We're not at, at 200, but this would be his second biggest behind behind Roley, which was his biggest. Oh, okay. If the Roley Romero fight was Gervonta Davis's biggest box office fight, which reportedly brought in an estimated 250 or 275,000, we should now question whether or not that's what it actually did. We should because it was the pundits who reported that Gervonta Davis versus Hector Garcia did 225,000 buys or around there. And what uh, Stefan is saying in his own words is that it did, you heard him. They're not at 200,000 buys, let alone 225,000. It's all smoke and mirrors, man. Leverage tactics. They want the boxing community at large to believe that Gervonta Davis is a bigger draw than he actually is on the premise that that might attract more customers, that might attract more buyers, more people that want to be at the fight and purchase the pay-per-view. That's why they do it. They do it to keep up appearances. Positive mindset, positive outcome that kind of deal. They figure if they repeat that Javante Davis is a star enough times, if they repeat that long enough, people will start to believe it and act in kind. That if they repeat that Javante Davis is this big box office draw enough times, eventually it'll come true. That's what they figure. But if Javante Davis's last fight brought in under 200,000 buys, if it brought in under that, how big a star is he really? Not big at all. These sound bites are making the rounds here on the YTBC at a time when the Tank Davis versus Ryan Garcia fight is in serious jeopardy, per sources. Golden Boy believes it had an agreement on the rematch clause. If Garcia won, Golden Boy and DAZN would control the rematch, which only Davis can exercise. Contract came back with the PBC controlling it. When you think about that, you think about how Javante Davis's last fight didn't even crack 200,000 buys. Perhaps Javante Davis's leverage in this situation, his leverage in all of this, perhaps it's being grossly overstated, exaggerated, just like his pay-per-view buys. If you don't fight Ryan Garcia, who are you gonna fight? What are you supposed to substitute that with? Because your fights, unlike Ryan Garcia's fights, your fights are a lot more expensive. Your fights are billed as box office fights. Who the fuck are you fighting that I should have to pay $80 to see it? Not Devin Haney. Not Vasil Lomachenko, not Teofimo Lopez, and apparently not Ryan Garcia. If this fight falls apart, Golden Boy Promotions believes it has given in on everything. 
Garcia, they say, is the B-side in every possible way. They are adamant that they will not budge on a rematch. They have obligations to DAZN, which has paid Garcia millions over the last four years. It has become a non-negotiable issue. Ryan's made a lot of concessions to get this fight. 136-pound catch weight set by the Gervonta Davis people. The fact that the fight and the lead promoter for the show is Showtime and the PBC and not Golden Boy. The fact that Gervonta Davis has a rematch clause and Ryan doesn't. I think that Ryan has made more than enough concessions to get this fight over the line. More than enough concessions to get Gervonta Davis in the ring when that guy can't even crack 200,000 pay-per-view buys. His celebrity? His drawing power, as it were, is grossly overstated. And I've often said that here on the channel, that he might be able to put some asses in some seats. He might be able to sell tickets. He might do okay at the gate. But at the box office, he's no superstar. And that's where the money is. You can only make so much money at the gate. There's only so many seats for so many asses. The hope is that at the box office... That has no cap. That has no ceiling. The hope is that the bulk of the cash and the bulk of the revenue will come from the pay-per-view buys. And what do we see? We see that Gervonta Davis didn't crack 200,000 pay-per-view buys with his last fight. You really aren't that big a draw to be drawing your weight around like that. You need this fight for your platform more than they do. You don't fight Ryan. Who are you going to fight? Roly Romero again? Isaac Cruz again? What's that going to do at the box office? Because remember, your fights are billed as pay-per-views. His aren't. So even if he does end up with some Tommy Tomato Can kind of guy. It's no sweat off the consumer's back. It doesn't cost them anything extra. It doesn't cost them a thing. That's the difference. That's why there's more pressure on the PBC and Showtime to get this fight over the line than there is on Ryan and Golden Boy. Ryan and Golden Boy aren't selling $80 fights. They're not the ones that have to justify that hefty price tag, but Gervonta Davis and the PBC, they do. How many people do you think want to see him box Roly Romero? How many really? How many people do you think want to see him box Isaac Cruz again. After five consecutive pay-per-view appearances, you tell me if Javante Davis's audience is growing when his last fight didn't crack 200,000. Where's the growth? You've been on pay-per-view five times. Where are the super fights? Because nobody's putting on more pay-per-views with that hefty price tag than the PBC and all of Gervonta Davis's fights. They're all pay-per-views. So how do you justify it? You can. That's why his audience isn't growing. You're putting fights behind a paywall that nobody was asking for to begin with. Nobody was asking him to fight Isaac Cruz or Roly Romero or Hector Garcia. Or Mario Barrios or Leo Santa Cruz. The guy they do ask you to fight, you blow them off. Way to grow your audience there, genius. Ignore the customers, why don't you? That'll get you more customers. These guys are doing business backwards. And if this Ryan Garcia fight don't happen, they ain't got nothing to substitute it with. And just in keeping with the theme of news, at or around these weights, Teofimo Lopez Sr. shreds Gervonta Davis. Every time the tank fights somebody, I don't know who they are. I'm not a fan of a lot of things that Teofimo Lopez Sr. says or does. But his candor does ring with a bit of truth. Hector Luis Garcia stood across the ring from him, him being Gervonta Davis. Although the 31-year-old has represented the Dominican Republic in the Olympic Games and would go on to become a world champion at 130 pounds, Lopez Sr. reveals that he was clueless as to who Garcia actually was, along with every other foe Davis has ever shared the ring with. They fight in fucking nobodies, said Lopez Sr. to BoxingScene.com. I didn't even know who this dude was. Every time the tank fights somebody, I don't know who they are. But despite Davis facing what Lopez Sr. views as cannon fodder, he acknowledges that the Baltimore native is very much a star. The numbers themselves tell a different story. And as stated, even though I'm not a fan of a lot of things that Teofimo Lopez Sr. says or does, he's not wrong about Gervonta Davis. He's going in there with guys that they're not very well known. Nope. And they're staging these fights behind a paywall more often than anyone else, limiting the number of eyes and exposure that the fight gets because it's behind a paywall. Most people these days, they're not going to pay you $80 to pounce on somebody they've never heard of. Why do you think Javante Davis's last fight didn't crack 200,000 pay-per-view buys? Nobody knows Hector Luis Garcia, and nobody was asking Javante to fight him. People that do know Hector Luis Garcia, the people familiar with this fighter, they know he's a 130-pound fighter. 
fighter. They know he's proven absolutely nothing in the men's lightweight division. And they know that Gervonta Davis brought him up from 130 up to 135. That's what they know. I myself thought the fight wouldn't have been so bad if it weren't billed as a pay-per-view, if it weren't behind a paywall. If it were a regular Showtime fight, it would have been all right. Solid matchup. Semi-solid. Lopez believes that Davis has found a winning formula, one that he wholeheartedly disagrees with. Tank is trying to make as much money as he can by fighting nobodies. And that's exactly what he's done, and that's exactly why his audience isn't growing. You're putting fights behind a paywall that nobody's even asking for. You're ignoring the consumer base, the boxing community at large, and what fights they want you to have. And in place of those fights... You're fighting guys like Roly Romero. Isaac Cruz, Hector Luis Garcia. Those fights are only consumed by a very nominal, insulated fan base. You're only gonna sell, but so many pay-per-view buys. Your audience is only gonna grow, but so much fighting those kinds of guys, fighting those kinds of people. It's for this reason I emphasize that there's actually more pressure on Gervonta Davis to deliver this Ryan Garcia fight, because if he doesn't, what are his alternatives? You know, Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy Promotions, they actually have a better working relationship with Bob Arum than Al Heyman does. You don't do this Davis fight. What stops Ryan Garcia from knocking on Bob's door and seeing about a Teofimo Lopez fight? What's stopping him from fighting a Lopez? What's stopping him from fighting a George Cambosos? Golden Boy's got a better working relationship with Top Rank than the PBC does, and Ryan might have at least one or two alternatives to a Davis fight. Remember what the deal structure for the Davis fight was. Ryan Garcia was willing to go to Showtime for the Gervonta Davis fight. Would he be willing to go to ESPN for a Teofimo Lopez fight? Or would Bob be willing to send Teofimo to the zone. I happen to think between Oscar De La Hoya and Bob Arum, they could actually work something out if this fight falls apart. But if this fight falls apart, who's Javante Davis supposed to substitute Ryan with? Javante's fights are more expensive than Ryan's. Ryan's fights aren't box office fights. Javante's are. Nobody on the PBC has the notoriety of a Ryan Garcia. None of those guys over there bring to the table what he brings to the table. In truth, none of those guys at the PBC bring to the table what a Devin Haney brings to the table, a Lomachenko, a Lopez, hell, even a George Cambosos. George beat Teofimo Lopez in one of the biggest upsets in postmodern boxing. George Cambosos is more of a somebody than that gang of nobodies at the PBC. The PBC who's charging the consumer, charging the boxing fan, more money than everyone else for fights that no one is asking for. There was a time when Javante Davis was a bright young up-and-comer who had all the potential to become a big box office star. But over time, in isolating him from the rest of the world of boxing, they put a cap, they put a ceiling on how far he could go. Because he can't go but so far fighting those people. Boxing is too fragmented for you to try to surround yourself in a biosphere. Sometimes the big fights, the really big ones, they're going to require you to work with other people. And you need to be flexible. I think that Al Heyman and the PBC, they're not being flexible by demanding that the second fight... That if Javante Davis loses and he exercises his rematch clause, the second fight has to be on Showtime? What about Ryan? What about Golden Boy? What incentive are you giving them to do this fight?